Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, there's a new mode around uh, called uh, FreeDV, which is a voice over uh, digital, uh, particularly for HF. And I've been playing around with it, as have a number of other people. Uh, but Peter asked me to um, put together a little presentation about it. So, um, so I thought um, uh, I'd just talk a little bit about why I'm interested in digital voice on HF and uh, why it's a good idea. A bit about um, Codec 2, which is, the, which is the thing that encodes voice into a very low bitrate data stream. And uh, that's been written by an Australian, uh, David Rowe, based in Adelaide. Um, I'll also, uh, and, and, uh, to, I, I felt quite unqualified to talk about how that actually works. So uh, when Peter asked me to talk about it, I, um, I wrote to David, uh, sent him an email uh, last week, and, uh, and said that I was giving this talk. And uh, we've sort of spoken over the last few years on and off. Um, and he said, oh, I'm in Sydney. Why don't I come and see you? So I took the opportunity to talk to him, and I've got a video to play where I ask him how it works. So, so you won't just have to have my second-hand version. Um, I'll also uh, talk a little bit about getting started, and I'll show you the software uh, here. And, um, and there's a bunch of resources around um, uh, to help out. So firstly, uh, what does it look like, and uh, how does it sound? This is a contact with Patrick. So it sounds a little bit weird at the moment. I mean, it's uh, it's understandable uh, for those that know Patrick VK2PN. It, it does sound like his voice, even though it's going over a channel which is half the bandwidth of a normal sideband channel. So it's 1.1 kilohertz bandwidth, and yet you get uh, the sound of his voice. You get uh, expression. Uh, it's understandable. So it's it's I think a great achievement. And of course, the big thing for HF is there's no background noise. I mean, it's just. It's very pleasant to listen to. You can leave it running on the channel, and when someone comes up, you just you just hear them. So, you know, I think it's I think it's a great potential. Uh, you know, putting aside the fact that uh, it, that you know it's using less bandwidth. So, I guess why digital voice? Uh, I mean, a digital voice, a low bit rate codec is actually quite a rare thing. There's only a few people in the world who make them, and um, they're different to something like MP3, which actually samples the waveform and then somehow manages to compress that and send that. Uh, low bitrate voice codecs do it in a different way, and, and I'll get David to explain that. They do produce um, understandable speech, as you heard, and you even you can recognize the voice. So it's not quite as robotic as uh, some of the commercial ones that are out there. Um, used with a, it needs to be used with a modem. Uh, the one that we use is uh, FDMDV. And that, as I said, is just 1.1 kilohertz. Um, and so you can just plug it straight in. I'm using a uh, signal link. So just, just the normal data mode uh, interface that you would use uh, is all that's needed. You can literally plug straight into a, uh, a microphone socket. So no special you know, direct access to the transceiver is needed. Um, it, uh, Codec 2 is actually very good compared to even the commercial uh, patented proprietary codecs that are out there. Uh, it uses half the bandwidth of the codec that's used in DSTAR. So it's already better than that. Um, I believe it uses a quarter of the bandwidth of the Yaesu DMR TRBO uh, systems. So it's it's better. I, I guess these things uh, are pretty old now, and that, you know, just because they've become commercial standards doesn't mean they're good. And of course, the big thing about using less bandwidth is, of course, you've got more power to transmit in that bandwidth. So you get out of the noise more than if you're using a, a wider bandwidth. So a lot of benefits there. There is a text channel that goes along with it, uh, so that you, you know, typically you send your your password, uh, sorry, your um, uh, call sign and uh, a little bit of data about where you are, and that actually uses the same uh, PSK31 vericode, you know, the the encoding that uses uh, less bits for common letters and that, that kind of stuff. So he's actually used, adopted the same thing there. So there are some other uh, codecs around the Speaks and Opus, but uh, both of them are much higher bit rate. Um, the uh, you know some of the commercial ones like D Star. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I was interested in D Star, but disappointed that it wasn't open source. That we can't really tinker with it. And the whole system, although it's very capable and you know it's a great design with the trunking and all of this kind of stuff, it's locked into that codec, which seems to me to be an enormous mistake. It should have just said, 
here's a system for, for connecting and the codec can be set at runtime. They didn't do that for some reason. Uh, if you want to use uh, codec to, uh, sorry, uh, DSTAR on a computer, you actually have to buy a physical USB dongle that has the proprietary codec built into it, which is, which is, it is available, but that's nuts. Um, so the thing with uh, Codec 2, the source code is available. You can tinker with it. It's very easy to build on all sorts of platforms. Uh, as I said, I, um, I have been in contact with David Rowe a little bit over, um, over the, in fact, what, during the development of this project. I spotted it uh, when he first started on it and sent him a small donation. And I urge anyone else to do it. Uh, he's doing this. You know, he could be doing other things. So I, um, I spoke to him last week when he was in Sydney. and. Uh, uh, turned out he was in the city and I was in the city and, and so that worked out really well. So uh, here's a, a, a about a um, seven minute interview with him uh, where I basically ask all the questions which, which you might have asked me. Um, so uh, I didn't record my own voice so I put up, you can't hear me a bit, but I've put up a caption saying what the question is. What was your motivation to create Codec 2? Well, it, I actually did a PhD in low-rate speech coding in the 1990s and um, did some okay research, but the output wasn't a practical speech codec. Um, other things then distracted me for 10, 15 years, and then Bruce Perens, uh, open source advocate, mm. turned up and said, we need an open-rate speech codec, so it was a chance to um, really use my skills. You know, there aren't many people who can do low bit-rate speech coding. Um, dust off my PhD, which everyone always wants to have another crack at, mm. and it was for a, a good cause. Um, there is no open source low-rate speech codec beneath 5,000 bits per second. So something the world needed, uh, in particular the ham community, Absolutely. but many other applications as well. Mm. So where do you see codec 2 being used? Do you think it will end up in telephone systems? Possibly. Um, I initially thought it was mainly digital radio, where bandwidth is at an absolute premium, in particular on HF and VHF. Um, but there are a lot of people keep wanting to use it on VoIP. Um, one of the issues is the packet overheads for VoIP uh, are around 8,000 bits per second per packet. So uh, that's you know ten times the bandwidth of the codec nearly. Um, so there's a inefficiency there. However, if you use it for trunking, if you're sending say 32 phone calls from one IP address to another IP address, mm -hmm. then you've still only got that 8,000 bits per second overhead. But you're sending 30 channels, then it starts to become efficient. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we're getting interest in people using it for um, maritime communications. There's a lot of people, often uh, poor people, who work on ships at sea, want to talk home, and that the only way is through expensive uh, satellite channels. So if you can it, save those few bits per second, it really makes a difference to those guys. Now, yeah. um, we're not mathematicians, but can <laughs> you give us a feeling for how you've been able to turn intelligible speech into an incredibly small amount of data? Yeah, well, Codec 2 uses what's called uh, model-based speech coding. So we construct a model of how the human voice is created, and then we send those model parameters over the channel. Uh, rather than a typical a, a high rate codec like one you might use for MP3s, that looks at the speech at the signal waveform and tries to send the waveform. We don't care about the waveform at all; just the, f the really basic factors that uh, we perceive when we listen to speech. And um, how it works is sort of kind of familiar to a lot of hams, um, it uses a harmonic model of speech. Normally harmonics are a problem, you know, in our transmitter we want to get rid of the third and fifth one, but in mm. that's how speech works. Speech is a harmonic waveform. We have our pitch as the fundamental, and then a bunch of harmonics after that. So at the moment my pitch might be 120 hertz, and what you're also hearing is 240, 360, 480. So what Codec 2 does is works out what that pitch is, and then sends a little bit of information about each harmonic for example, what the amplitude of that harmonic is compared to the previous one. And uh, by sending just those model parameters, you get this, uh, these incredible compression rates uh, compared to a waveform codec. The flip side is it won't send general audio waveforms. So if you try and put music through it, it'll get distorted. Even background noise can be a real problem. And that's something we need to make special care of because you might be using it with, uh, in a car or uh, with a high background noise. So there are, are some issues with low bitrate speech coding. So uh, Codec 2, in terms of radio, is half the story. That gives you a, a, a bit stream. Yes. How do we then modulate that onto a sideband transmitter? Right. Well, the next stage is we need a modem that's capable of sending um, a digital signal over an analog channel, in particular the HF analog channel. And what we do for that is we use something called a multi-tone or parallel tone modem, where we send, uh, instead of one carrier at, say, 1,400 bits per second, we have, uh, I think, 14 carriers each sending two bits in each carrier, um, which ends up at 50 board, which ends up being the 1400 bits per second. And the reason we do that is on a HF channel you have multipath issues. Some of those carriers may get uh, wiped out by multipath interference. And so to avoid losing the whole digital signal, we split them up into multiple carriers so that only part of the signal is uh, corrupted.
And is there redundancy? Is there forward error correction? Uh, currently there isn't, but that'll probably be the next step. Um, one of the, the, the idea is that if one of those carriers is removed, you then use forward error correction to correct it. Um, there's two schools of thought. One is we use the human brain to correct it. Mm. It turns out that even if you lose part of the signal, there's still quite a lot left there. And hams in particular, or people who are used to using HF radio, are quite used to pulling l uh, legible speech out of the noise. So the human brain can do a lot of uh, error correction. And the other approach, the more traditional com, you know, communications theory approach, is put a lot of FEC. Um, I'm violently resisting that because I've spent half my life dropping the, the bit rate and uh, people turn around and want to double it for, for, with forward error correction. And, and uh, I guess that also <laughs> slows down the decoding, doesn't it? Um, well, it makes you raise the bit rate a little bit, so it doesn't necessarily slow it down, but it requires an additional bit rate. There's trade-offs there. Sometimes that's worth it. Sometimes there's not. Right. Mm. So for early adopters, uh, what can we do to help you and, and help to make uh, hmm. Vernic 2 and, uh, and the modem work better? Gee, that's a really good question. Um, I guess I'm getting a lot of feedback and you know, enthusiastic response from people like yourself, and that really gets me interested. Um, I've had some people send recorded files. Mm -hmm. uh, I send, um, for example, when I send known data over the channel, I can then measure the channel parameters and uh, modify the modem codec, experiment with FEC. Uh, generally, feedback, I guess, is helpful. Um, if a lot of the coding involved is you know, high-end DSP, which not everyone can do, but if people can program, there's also a lot of just GUI programming, mm -hmm. making buttons appear on the screen. And mm -hmm. uh, I've sort of been forced to do that because uh, with another colleague who wrote Free DV, David Witten, um, because no one else would step up and do it, but obviously it's not the best use of my time. Sure. Yeah, and we have had, having said that, we have had people come up with patches for the Mac and uh, for FreeBSD to get it running. So we're starting to get those sort of feedback. So lots of non-specialized programming and support, uh, you know, make file support, that sort of thing to be done. Right. Yeah. Just one more question. It, it strikes me that the modem alone could be useful as a digital keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard mode. Have you mm. any thoughts about that? Yeah, a couple of people have suggested that just recently on the mailing list, uh, in particular with some FEC. Some early adopters have already tried it. Everything runs on the Linux command line, so they've done things like just catted text files over the, mm. the channel. What it lacks is any sort of ARQ, so if you lose a few bytes there's no way to retransmit them right, yeah. uh, speech we don't really care if you lose a packet you mm -hmm. certainly don't want to go back and reconstruct it right. you're interested in getting the next packet through correctly how would it compare to psk 31 for example uh, it's using psk uh, already it's just doing it on 1400 bits per second rather than 31 bits per second right. so the signal to noise ratio it could operate at would be much higher than psk 31 because the bit rate is much higher but fundamentally they both use the same modulation so they'll have the same bit error rate performance right. Mm. We even use the very code that they use for the, the side oh, data really? channel. Okay. Yeah, and the author of PSK31 has been very helpful in developing the motor, modem, Peter Martinez Fantastic. from England. Yeah. Is there anything else um, you'd like to say or I should ask you? Uh, I can't think of anything. All right, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So that's uh, David Rowe, uh, VK5DR, and uh, great guy. So it was really uh, nice of him to take that time. Um, so just to recap on, on what he explained there about how it works, it, it doesn't sample the audio. It basically uh, estimates the, the primary frequency of your voice. It also looks at what harmonics are present. And uh, it also samples the energy, the, the loudness of the, the voice. And it does that uh, every 20 milliseconds. And then that is reproduced at the receiving end. And what you get back is something that sounds like the voice of what went in at the beginning. So it's really quite different to, to other sorts of codecs, these low bit rate codecs. Um, so it's a model of the speech, it's not, it's not the, the sampling at all. Each packet is 56 bits and they're sent every 40 milliseconds. Um, it sends all of those packets at uh, a rate of 1400 bits per second. Um, now a standard telephone call takes 64 kilobits, so this is uh, 45th of that space. It's, it's a hugely uh, smaller than, um, uh, than what we normally use for telephony, but of course it does sound a bit weird to normal ear. Um, so, as he said, it's not really going to be useful for voice over IP. It really is useful for things like uh, voice over HF. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we do have limited spectrum, so we can fit more channels in. Uh, and this, of course, um, will work for VHF as well, where we could have even, you know, smaller channels there as well. Uh, and the lower bit rate means you've got more power to get each of the carriers above the, the noise floor. Um, uh, of course, just send it, we're just sending the data. There's no handshaking or anything, so there's no overhead. So you know, it's just that data going through. So how do we get on the air? Um, 
as I said, Kodak 2 takes your voice and it turns it into a bit stream. Uh, we then need to modulate that. The other side of the story is this modem uh, FDMDV, which stands for Frequency Division Multiplex Digital Voice. Um, there is existing software out there that does that, but it wasn't open source. It was well specified, and so David, with some help, uh, has actually re-implemented according to the spec this modem, and that's now open source. So uh, the software free DV is actually a combination of Codec 2 and FDMDV put together with a bit of GUI and a bit of setup uh, into one package. But the software is available separately, and the, the Codec 2 software, uh, you can download that, and the modem you can download. And what you get is command line tools. So for people who are familiar with Unix, you can cat from an audio file through Codec 2, then you get another bag of bits, and you can cat that into the modem, and you'll get audio coming out of that, uh, which can be modulated. So you can just play around on the command line, and there's a bunch of test scripts that have test audio and so on. On the uh, waterfall, uh, FDMV looks like this. Uh, as David said, it's 14 carriers. There's actually a 15th carrier uh, in the center, which is uh, double the power. And that's used so that the, uh, the receiver can automatically uh, sync up, track the, the transmitter. So that makes it very easy to, uh, for them to, to automatically track. Uh, and there's some displays. Um, so the FDM modem is 14 slow modems, 75 hertz apart each running at 50 board, and as I said, there's one inserted in the middle, which you can see the, the stronger trace, and it will sync on it. So this does work well on HF, where you do tend to get selective fading, so you might lose one of the carriers. Um, you know, there's a bit of, uh, there's a lot, David said to me over lunch, there's, there's a lot of things that can be tweaked in Codec 2 and in the modem. And one of them, of course, is the bits that are sent in the model. Some of them are more important than others. So things like the energy level is quite important. If that goes missing, you're likely to have your headphones blasted off. So there's a lot of tweaking that can be done about, you know, well, look, it doesn't really matter if we miss on some harmonics of this bit, but, you know, maybe it's important that the, the energy is right. Um, Okay, so uh, this, the software free DV looks like this. Um, uh, it works on Windows. It's, it's just basically a zip file with a folder that has the executable and all of the libraries that it uses. So you just unzip it, uh, drag it on your machine and run it. Uh, it turns out it also runs on the Mac, uh, on Wine. Uh, it's available for Unix. I've, I've had a few goes at building it for Ubuntu without great success. Uh, I'm using a recent version of Ubuntu and it links against some old libraries. There is now a script that makes it easy to download and build, but it's still uh, it's not, not great at this point. Um, there are binary RPMs for Fedora as well. So getting set up, basically, um, the most success I've had, I, I have run into some audio problems, and I guess this is still an area that needs further work. If you try to use uh, your onboard audio, just in, say, a, a netbook or something, with one USB device, you, you can run into situations it's not able to uh, resample the audio. Now, obviously, in time, that should work. But at the moment, my advice is to use two USB audio devices, one uh, going to your speaker and headphones, uh, sorry, and microphone, and the other one going to the radio. So I use a signal link, and that, of course, is a USB device. It turns out it, it does actually work on the Mac. Uh, that's one of those things. The audio is a bit better. But on PCs, I've just not been able to get it to work without using two USB devices. Um, Stereo is not required, it's just a mono system, so even the really cheap little USB dongles are fine. They tend to have uh, mono input. Um, the software has this uh, uh, a little bit scary setup thing where you set up the audio. I'll, I'll run it um, myself after this slideshow. Uh, so this is from the radio, and um, the signal link just comes up saying uh, USB audio codec. That's to speakers, and there's another tab. Uh, for the transmit side, and that's from the microphone and to the radio. And at the moment, it, it tends to lose its settings. Um, I'm not sure. I think that when you unplug USB devices, they, they come up in a different order or something. So it, look, it's version 0.9. It's a first release. It works, but it can be a little bit finicky, particularly on the audio side. For keying the transmitter, uh, David does recommend um, uh, some sort of serial push to talk. Uh, I don't have that, so I'm just using Vox. And uh, that seems to work okay for me. Uh, basically, when you hit the transmit button, it, you know, the audio comes up, and it's just a, a solid, even uh, volume audio. So that works quite well, um, and that's been fine. Uh, there's also this data channel, slow, low bit rate data channel that goes along with it, and you just put your call sign or whatever you want in there. In the main window, um, 
This is uh, a contact with uh, Patrick VK2PN. Looks looks perfect on the on the uh, waterfall. Oh, incident! I'll, I'll show you when I run it. But uh, there's a variety of different displays you can get, including indications of how things are going internally in terms of tracking and so on. And you can have more than one display. This is the um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, it's showing the phase of the the modem. So it should ideally it should be four spots, but you can see there's quite a lot of errors have crept in there. Even so, I can I can um, uh, hear what was being said there. Um, when you're transmitting, you can see your uh, audio level coming in. Again, this area is a little bit finicky. You've got to avoid clipping or things really fall apart. Um, it seems to, I don't know, maybe what it needs is a peak limiter built in on the mic or some sort of compressor because it can be a little bit um, uh, finicky. And I know that um, VK2JI, who's been doing the broadcast, uh, the last, did anyone listen into that broadcast a couple of weeks ago? I found the audio very hard to, to read on that, and I think it was something to do with levels or, or RF feedback or something, so it'll be on again tonight. Hopefully it'll be a bit better. Uh, there's a bunch of resources around. Uh, freedv.org is the place to download the software. Uh, in particular, there's the Windows just binary. You just download it and it just runs. Uh, codec2.org has got more technical information about the codec, and as I said, the source code is separate, so you can build the command line tools and they work well. Uh, David's website is uh, rotel.com uh, and he's got a blog there of what he's up to and I'm sure after when he gets back from holidays he'll be, uh, he'll be back on there as well. Um, there's a Google group, uh, Digital Voice. Uh, a few people are complaining about the fact that you have to have a Google account to even look at it, which is a bit of a pity, but I, I guess the other side of that argument is uh, this problem with spam and everything. So yeah, you need to just get a Google account to have a look at it. And there's a lot of discussion on there, people saying, oh, I'm looking for a QSO on 14.236 in Eastern Australia and things like that, so it's a good place. Um, David spoke at the Linux Conf in 2012, and there's a great video of his talk at that, so it's worth having a look at. Uh, and uh, yeah, 14236 is the main channel on 20 meters, and I call CQ on there, uh, although I tend to get other modes coming back. Um, I believe that the broadcast tonight is going to be broadcast again on uh, 40 meters, and I'm just not sure it was 71. Yeah, he was on 190. I believe it was in the broadcast this morning, but I didn't hear that. Um, 7240, okay. Okay, yeah, that's the problem with 40 metres at night, yeah. So I did listen, to then, listen in tonight. Uh, that's a good way to get started. So um, what I might do is I'll just, um, I'll just uh, end this and I'll just run the software up on this machine. So I'll try not to deafen everyone. So that's how it sounds on air. Now, now. So here's the software. Uh, I'm running under Wine on the Mac. It seems to work fine under Wine. Um, and I'll just go to the settings. Audio config. Uh, from the radio, USB codec. Two speakers built in output. Um, apply that. And say OK. And then I push Start. Audio. And I can transmit that uh, as low power across the bench. So this is an off-air uh, recording just in, in one room. I um, had that, but it uh, seems like the uh, audio recorder has quite a large uh, output range and the KX3 mic input can handle the input. So, you know, the case is making up these cables, but that's to make a, um, uh, a different, uh, I put a pad on there to avoid clipping on the microphone input, so I've got a general one. Uh, get errors in the, the uh, data that goes on there. Uh, uh, from radio? Oh, there we go. Yeah, well, I'm just with it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, no, no, no. I no. just get that. Oh, 
Okay, so uh, one thing I discovered is that these tabs you can drag, uh, you can sort of drag them into the middle here and get, you know, more see more displays simultaneously. So in order to get set up, I, I typically use uh, the signal link, and I've just been using an FT817, and um, just on Vox that seems to work well. Um, you, you can also uh, switch to analog mode. I'll, if I just play again, you can go analog, and then you can actually talk sideband using your headset and everything. So you can kind of switch back and forward between um, digital and analog just using the same gear. So that's free TV. Um, I've had probably most success running it under um, Ubuntu. Uh, the, the biggest challenges at this point are uh, just sound cards and, and sampling rates and things like that.